Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Cram, host of the Art and Fiction Podcast. This episode features Suzanne Dunlap, author of more than a dozen historical novels for adults and teens. Five of her novels are listed on Art and Fiction, including The Portraitist in the Visual Arts category, Emily's Voice and Liz's Kiss in the Music category, and The Adored One in the Theater category. Today I'm speaking with Suzanne about The Courtesan's Daughter, listed in the film category on Art in Fiction. Suzanne grew up in Buffalo, New York, and has lived in London, Brooklyn, Northampton, Massachusetts, and now Biddeford, Maine. Her love of historical fiction arose partly from her PhD research at Yale. Suzanne is also an author, accelerator, certified book coach in fiction and nonfiction, specializing in coaching historical fiction and historical nonfiction. Welcome to the Art and Fiction Podcast, Suzanne. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. You're welcome. I have never read a novel that centers around silent film in the early 20th century, which is what The Courtesan's Daughter does. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose? this air this time that's so interesting because unlike maybe many writers i don't sort of take what i know about and decide to write on what i know about i take something that interests me and then i investigate it and then that's what i write about i had some vague background knowledge um and i think i'd seen the vitagraph sign on the uh on the chimney in in Brooklyn, which I think has now been taken down. I think that recently was demolished. But uh, other than that, and some vague kind of um, anecdotal information about it, I really didn't know a lot. But I was also fascinated with um, the woman, um, Alice Guy Blachet, who is the French filmmaker who was very pioneering. and, And, you know, when I found out she spent a chunk of time in New York. And I thought, oh, there's got to be a story there somewhere. Yeah, that was fascinating. So she's real, Alice. Oh, she's absolutely real. Alice Guy, was her name? Yeah, Alice Guy, Alice Guy Blaché, involved in the film industry in France, and then came over and uh, did a lot of things. I mean, her films that are mentioned in the book are real films that she made. And uh, she directed things and, and the description of her studio that was pretty close to what her in Queens, I think was hers. Brooklyn was Vitagraph. And um, yeah, so I'm always interested in women who are pioneering in various arts. And I thought about just making it about her more biographical, but I just didn't feel like there was enough. uh, I don't know why. I just didn't feel like there was enough. So I have her in it as an important character, but she's not one of the protagonists, obviously. And that actually raises an interesting dilemma that we have as historical novelists. Like, do you center the novel around a real person or do you have fictional people that interact with your real person, which is what you did? And so really, we get super invested in the story of Sylvie and Justine. So it's kind of a mother-daughter novel as well, isn't it? Well, honestly, I actually set out to write a mother-daughter story because I realized that in all my other books, the mothers are just not there. They're either uh, dead or out of the picture or in some way just not there. And I thought, why is that? Why am I avoiding writing a mother into my fiction? Yeah. And so I decided I had to find a way to do it. And and that was sort of part of the uh, the impetus for the book. So you wanted to do the mother-daughter and then that kind of got with doing the um, the Vitagraph and the, the silent film era. And wanting the generational conflict in terms of what Sylvie wanted from life versus what her mother wanted for her from life and the fears and things like that that went along with it. Um, We could so relate to that. I, Well, as a mother, I was super related to to poor Justine and just how devastated when her mm -hmm. daughter leaves. And all the way through the novel, I'm like, oh, poor Justine. Like, I was really empathizing with her and and a little annoyed that Sylvie wasn't going back and you did that very very well with uh, the mother's fears and what it would be like to lose your daughter or not know where she is right and the thing is too when you add the historical the period aspect to it you know you have to think about what it was that parents worried about then and she as an immigrant and her living in that 
place in the tenements on the Lower East Side of New York, um, you know, her fears and everything are going to be very different from a mother's fears today, which are also very real, but it's, you know, it is a completely different thing. And that's part of what fascinates me. Part of what draws me again and again to writing historical fiction is really digging in and putting myself in the place of those people and thinking, what must she have felt like? You know, she's worked and worked and worked and thought she had everything all safe for her daughter and then bang, you know? Her so, daughter has other ideas. So back to the silent film, uh, this was 1907. So this is really early. Uh, what were the films like in those days? It's actually 1910. I settled on that for a couple of reasons. One of them was that there was this historic snowstorm in New York. And uh, and it just provided me with a way for her to, for Sylvie to run away and not easily be able to get back and not easily be found, you know, not easily be traceable because whatever. So that was one reason. The other reason was what was going on in, um, you know, when I started looking into Vitagraph and Edison's world and everything, what was going on at the time. And um, Jay Stewart Blackton, who was a uh, main guy at Vitagraph, fascinating character. And really, the, the studio was like they had glass ceilinged studios to get all the light. He really did that Moses thing and with this trick photography to get the the staff turned into a snake, really get loose in the studio, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. Where, where did you the... find all that out? Oh, gosh, you can find anything. There's actually a, a biography that I have. Uh, I got a book about J. Stewart Blackton that had a ton of information in it. Uh, but also, there's so much. Just, you know, you look in the archives in newspapers, and uh, it's hard to piece together where, where all of it came from. But yes. there was just a lot of great, real stuff that happened that you know, and the, the things that I take liberties with, obviously, are what were the people really like. For instance, the famous, the Vita, Vitagraph girl, uh, whose name I'm just for some reason not able to call to mind. Was that, was that Florence? Florence, thank you, Florence. Yeah. Um, she was, she did start out as a seamstress, um, and became uh, an actor in the films. And by all accounts, she was a really nice person. But I needed her <laughs> not to be... Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry about that, Florence. <laughs> but um, yeah, and uh, and the whole the whole thing of that they didn't put the actors' names on in the credits of the films. Yeah, interesting. So you, she was the Vitagraph girl. She did not have a name to the general public. So and they were very short too, weren't they? These. Oh yeah. Um... Well, they had to be because of because of the technology. And one of the things that uh, Blackton did that was very cutting edge was to make these longer films with multiple reels, because nobody wow. thought that anybody would sit through a long, you know, anything longer than a few minutes. But he did Midsummer Night's Dream that was filmed in his garden, <laughs> which was right near the studio. So he uh, was very much a pioneer himself. And they also traded you know, they, they cooperated with each other. They had their rivalries and whatnot, uh, but they were all known to each other. And yes. so it wasn't like there were these big studios that were in fierce competition at the time. I found it interesting that they generally did um, all their filming outside so they could only do it in the summertime, which I guess it's kind of led me to believe is that why they eventually moved to LA? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. The weather was a big thing, but they, they didn't necessarily... They filmed outside, but they also filmed in studios, but they were glass. So they had glass yes. ceilings and everything so that they could have, you know, the lighting. Um, Cooper Hewitt's, the big mm -hmm. la lamps that they used to, to illuminate. Um, it could supplement the daylight, but it couldn't supplant it. So uh, when, they, when they figured out they could go to California, it was a huge step. I'd never really thought about that, but that's why, you know, that it started in New York, but they ended up in California. I mean, that was never said in the novel, but uh, that's sort of a nice thing as, as a reader when you go, oh, that's why they did that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The other fascinating thing to me was that a lot of the outdoor location things were, were filmed in New Jersey, in uh, Fort Lee. They took a ferry because the bridge didn't exist at that time. It, it was built later. 
all this information that you have to get as an historical novelist. Yeah. Make sure it's right. I know, I know. And and then you research it and you're writing along and, and something makes you go back and double check something and you think, oh, that wasn't quite right. <laughs> I know, I hate that when that happens. When the I history doesn't it. conform to your plot. And a, another plot point sort of running through the novel is the existence of the photographs of young women in sort of underwear, which was considered, yeah. you know, pornographic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I presume that was real. It was real. The circumstances that I created, I have no way of knowing would have been the case at all. Mm -hmm. That was very much fiction. But uh, there is a, a lot of underworld stuff going on, you know, and with yes. the gangs and that sort of thing then. And, and I was fascinated by that, too. Because she gets her photograph taken and then unbeknownst to her, another photograph of her in her just in her underwear is, yeah. is then circulated as sort of dirty postcards kind of thing. Yes. And that, it's so interesting because I'm going to be teaching another workshop on March 2nd about the messy middle, about pacing in the messy middle. And the point is you have to seed those things at the beginning so that, you know, the, the fact of that photograph comes back at a point in the novel where it amps up the tension because it's discovered, right? So... Yes, that was really well done, actually. Yes, because when it came back, went, oh, yeah, right. I remember when she got that photograph taken. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yes, it is tough to get that messy middle. I'm in the messy middle right now in the novel oh, I'm currently working yeah. on. And yeah, it's messy. Well, what would you say is the theme of The Courtesan's Daughter? And I think the themes are, you know, a, a generational divide uh, mothers and daughters and expectations and that sort of thing mm -hmm. it's also uh, always when uh, in these early the circumstances and the difficulties that are there for women that are not there for men and how they how what risk they're at for things that men just don't have to worry about you know and that's even true. though that's still true today i think it was true even more in earlier times. Yeah. So also, I think always the importance and the power of artistic pursuits and creativity and yes. how they can enrich people's lives and how they are legitimate occupations and ways to carve an existence out of. And also, I think there's another one that you can't always judge a book by its cover to be really cliched and that, you know, just because somebody exists in a certain milieu doesn't mean they have to, that they're going to conform to it in the end. So um, we talked about you doing a short reading from The Courtesan's Daughter. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I thought I would read a little bit from when uh, when Sylvie first is at, she's, a, she's an accomplished seamstress, not as good as her yes. mother, but she's been helping her mother with piecework for as long as she can remember. So her way into uh, the movie studio is by, they needed a seamstress to replace Florence who yeah. became more of an actress. And although that is historical in some way, the existence of Sylvie and, and what she did is not, it's completely invented. But um, I, it was just so much fun to look up all the actors from these films, this, uh, you know, um, Oh, Gladys, who is this little girl actor, was a real person. So I thought I'd read a little bit about her, one of her fittings, her first fitting for a costume for Gladys. Gladys arrived for her final fitting later in the afternoon, the day after I started working at Vitagraph. I found a folding screen in a corner and figured it would do to give her a little privacy. But before I could set it up, Gladys breezed in and stripped down to her underclothes, not even shutting the door behind her. As fast as I could, I pulled the costume over her head and knelt down to mark the hem. So where did you come from? She said. My mouth was full of pins, which gave me a moment to think up an answer. Connecticut, I said, after I'd marked where to sew flowers on the bodice, the final fairy-like touch. I lifted the costume over Gladys's head. She didn't dress right away, though, just stood there looking at me. Where in Connecticut? Mother's folks are from New Haven. Damn. Not there, I said. Out in the country, on a farm. What about your mother and father? They're dead, I said. This put an end to the conversation. Here, try this on now. 
I watched Gladys twirl and flounce in the costume, which I considered a success and hoped the director, Mr. Kent, would too. That'll do, I guess, she said, flicking the skirt and not looking at me. What about you? I asked. Where do you come from? I wasn't used to asking people questions about themselves, and it felt bold and dangerous to do it. Oh, I've been in Manhattan mostly, except when I was touring in the Midwest. Touring? She grimaced. I hated it. Every night, the same thing, city after city, a song and a dance and reciting poetry until I got too old. Too old? When was that? A couple years ago, I was ready to quit anyway. Mama had me out there singing when I was three. To be on the stage so young, I couldn't imagine it. The dress is finished, but what will you wear on your legs? I thought for sure she must need bloomers or stockings or something. Mr. Blackton says my legs are to be bare. I don't care as long as it's warm in the studio. With that, she skipped out of the sewing room, kicking her heels up in a way I later learned was typical for her. I will leave that there. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Thank you so much. That's, it's always great to actually hear some a, a portion of a novel read by the author. I think it gives it yeah. an extra dimension. And it reminds the author of what she wrote. <laughs> exactly, because by the time it's out, you've kind of forgotten. I know it's like, oh, really? Did I write that? Cool. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, one of my goals with the Art and Fiction podcast is to talk about some sort of writing-related questions. And uh, so tell us one thing that you've learned from writing historical fiction that perhaps you didn't know before you started. Well, one of the big things is how the story is the most important thing. History yes. is important. And, and that's why we love the history. That's why we write this stuff. But if you don't let the story drive it, then it's not going to be successful. That's the, the biggest thing that I think you need to understand if you're going to write historical fiction. Yeah, and I think that's really true. I know it was in my case, I, I was terrified to write historical fiction. I said, you have to be a you know a PhD in history to yeah. write historical fiction, was the little voice in my head told me. I go, well, no, actually, you need to be a storyteller because you do know how to read. So yes. you, you can and research. It's all there. I mean, it was... I. You know, back in the day when, say, Anya Seton was writing, she was mm -hmm. one of the early proponents of historical fiction. She had to travel to, she had to go look in archives and everything, because, of course, there was no internet. We are so spoiled. Now, you, oh can my find, goodness. you can find misinformation, too, but the good information is there if you know how to look for it. Exactly. So, and so what are some of your research methods? Well, the Library of Congress is always a great place to start. And, you know, honestly, I often start with Wikipedia because the good articles in Wikipedia have uh, bibliographies and you can mm -hmm. find books there that you can go digging down a little bit further into something that you need to know. And I've discovered books in, in there that I have then gone to bookfinder.com and gotten reprints or old copies of used books through them if you have a really good library near you if you have access to a university library often you can get those books in that library i do have a phd but and and, it, and it, to a certain degree it was responsible for my wanting to write historical fiction i think as long as the story is good and you're not putting in anachronisms all over the place which yes. really drives me nuts um <laughs> Readers will go along with you. What they want is to be completely engrossed in the story, to love the protagonists, yes. and to just keep reading and, and be be immersed in this other time and and often learn something too. I shouldn't say it's easier to write historical fiction than to write an academic treatise, but you don't have to have all those footnotes and you don't have to uh you know, justify every single word of what you wrote. I was an academic as well. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't do a PhD in history, but I did do a master's. So, you know, I've got an academic background. And I remember feeling it was actually kind of relaxing that you didn't have to footnote everything and you didn't have to be so uh, rigid, you know, yeah. in, in what you could say and not. Um, have you ever had a paper peer reviewed for publication? No, and I didn't go that high up. I wasn't. Okay, well, I have I have one peer reviewed paper that's in the journal Women in Music because mine was in music history. I submitted another paper for peer review and to another journal, 
and you get your peer reviews. And when I received these, at least one of them, I think was only, the person was so nasty and so horrible and just tore it apart. And, you know, you didn't, you didn't do that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, for I won't go into the whole story of what started me writing actual historical fiction, but then when I submitted something to an agent, um, my my agent I ended up with, uh, mm -hmm. basically, I had this story based on some research that I'd done for my PhD that I was really interested in this period and this concept. And he <laughs> called me on the phone and said, what you've written is not a novel. But, but he then talked to me for an hour, sent me some things, books to read and everything. And when I started reading about, you know, storytelling side, I went, oh, I get it now. I see what the difference is. And in the meantime, I'd sent some pages off to this was in the days where most agents still weren't accepting electronic submissions. You know? Wow. And so I sent some pages off to an agent on the West Coast and, I, you know, they went away. I figured, oh, that's you know, they whatever. Months and months later, I actually got a response back and she didn't take me, but she said, you know, there, you're really interesting voice and this and that. It's not really a page turner, which is what they're like, but she was so nice about it. You know? Wow, that's unusual. You don't get that much you, anymore. Yeah. You know, well, what you don't get, you they, they don't tear you apart. They just sort of give you a, a, a like a sorry, not for me kind of thing. Yeah, I was to going yeah. into great detail about how awful it is, which is what the the, the academic paper thing happened. Yes, so I'm I always rather good. grateful yeah. I did not go on. I had an advisor who wanted me to do a PhD. Mine was in theater. Uh -huh. And I just thought, yeah, you know, I don't think that's for me. I want to be a novelist when I grow up. <laughs> and actually just I'm really interested in the fact that you did your PhD or your academic background was in music. So what, what era? Because I, I uh, also music. love music. In music history. I my dissertation was uh, Viennese Italian reform opera, so mid eighteenth century. I love opera; that was a big thing, and I still haven't written the book that includes opera. I'm not sure whether I will ever do that, but oh, we've uh, got to do that. That's perfect well, for art and know, fiction. I know I have a beginnings of a manuscript. The other thing is, I was somewhat of a handle scholar. I gave a paper at the oh. International Baroque Conference in Dublin once, and you know, and um, I really wanted to write about uh, the woman who sang in the um, the first performance of Messiah in Dublin. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and she has a, such an interesting story. But I started it and then, you know, one thing and another, you have all those fragments around and everything like that. So maybe someday I'll go back to it. Um, in addition to being a novelist, you're a book coach and you do writing events. Tell us a little bit about um, what you do. Yeah, I... You know, it sort of harkens back to my academic thing because I really wanted to teach. <laughs> I love digging into figuring out how things work and really understanding things. And I love sharing that information with people. Yeah. I love work. One of my favorite things to do, I work with writers one on one and uh, help them write their books. It's the book coaching thing. And yeah. uh, it, it can, we work over time. Usually I have one author, um, one writer I'm working with who is almost finished with his big revision of his historical novel. And we've been working together for almost three years on it. And it's really rewarding for me to see how far people come, you know? Yeah. And, and that's, there's times where if somebody comes to me and, I, and they're not really ready for the kind of help I can give them, I can steer them somewhere else. What I focus on is not teaching you how to write, but teaching you how to write a book, which is completely different. Not, com I mean, obviously they're related, but that looking at the storytelling things, the the yeah. craft elements of fiction or memoir, which I also coach. Memoir, interestingly enough, is to me has a lot in common with historical fiction because it's real people, it's history, really, in, in a sense. There's a new another layer that it's your history, and there's, you know, but you also have to still find that thread in it that makes it a meaningful whole. And that it's not yeah. just this happened, then this happened, then this happened kind of thing. So um, in fact, myself and two other book coaches who are friends of mine, one of whom lives in Italy, are doing our second annual uh, women's memoir retreat here in, mm -hmm. 
in Biddeford in Maine, where I live. So uh, what are you working on now? Funny you should. I have I have two projects. One that I was working on, which I have sort of shelled for the moment for a reason that I'll explain. I have this four timeline historical novel uh, starts in the 1830s and ends up in the 1990s um, that has to do with the textile industry in New England and its relationship oh, to uh, uh, enabling slavery in the South and antebellum South and this sort of thing. And I've, I've, figured out a lot about it and I really I really like the story but it's a big challenge and it's hard 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 to do you know all those timelines are because it's like writing four separate novels in a way yeah. and then putting them together and then I started because I was doing going to be doing this uh pro writing aid workshop I said I just need to I need to switch my mind into historical romance and so I just started reading and you know ex exploring and I have literally read six Georgette Hare books in the last six weeks you know oh. oh this is so wonderful I love this and she is she's a masterful writer and or was you know um an impeccable research really yeah. really beautifully researched she has it totally down to the vernacular everything and I just thought I want to write a historical romance and so I have started writing a historical romance, a Regency romance. Oh, Regency. Favorite Regency period. romance. And it is so much fun. I just oh, can't tell be. you how much fun it is. So and I think I'll probably use a pseudonym, not because I'm ashamed of writing a Regency romance, oh, but because, it's branding. yeah, just to signal that it's something different from yeah. my normal output. But um, yeah, and I'm working with my coach on that and it's just so much fun yeah well that would be fun yeah well, it's one of my favorite periods because of course i'm a huge jane austen fan who isn't are we all yeah yeah really <laughs> we yeah. owe so much to her yeah well, truly. well thank you suzanne for talking with me this has been just delightful oh it's so much fun it's like yeah we gotta do this again <laughs> <laughs> i've been speaking with suzanne dunlap author of several novels listed on art and fiction, including The Courtesan's Daughter, listed in the film category at www.artandfiction.com. Be sure to check the show notes for a link to Suzanne's website at www.suzanne-dunlap.com. You'll also find a link to a 20% discount on a subscription to Pro Writing Aid, a fantastic editing tool for writers. If you are enjoying the Art and Fiction podcast, please help us keep the lights on by donating a coffee on the Ko-fi website. The link is in the show notes. Also, please follow Art and Fiction on Twitter and Facebook. And don't forget to give the Art and Fiction podcast a positive review or rating wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening.